Phantasmagoria and other poems asterisk 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 transcribed from the 1911 Macmillan and Company edition by David Price. Email ccx074 at pglaf.org Phantasmagoria and other poems by Lewis Carroll with illustrations by Arthur B. Frost Macmillan and Co. Limited St. Martin's Street, London 1911 Richard Clay and Sons, Limited Brunswick Street, Stamford Street, S.E., and Bungay, Suffolk. First published in 1869. Inscribed to a dear child, in memory of golden summer hours and whispers of a summer sea. Girt with a boyish garb for boyish task, eager she wields her spade, yet loves as well rest on the friendly knee, intent to ask the tale one loves to tell. Rude scoffer of the seething outer strife, unmeet to read her pure and simple sprite, deem, if thou wilt, such hours a waste of life, empty of all delight. Chat on sweet maid, and rescue from annoy hearts that by wiser talk are unbegilded. Ah, happy he who owns the tenderest joy, the heart love of a child. Away, fond thoughts, and vex my soul no more. Work claims my wakeful nights, my busy days, albeit bright memories of the sunlit shore yet haunt my dreaming gaze. Contents page Phantasmagoria, in seven cantos, I. The TRYSTYNG 1 2. HYS 5 Rules 10 3. Skarmogs 18 4. HYS Noriture 26 V by Command 34 6. Discomfiture 44 7. Sad souvenance 53 echoes 58 a sea dirge 59 ye carpet knit 64 hiawathas photographing 66 melancholetta 78 a valentine 84 the three voices the first voice 87 the second voice 98 the third voice 109 to Macon Veras Uni 118 a game of fives 120 Poeta Fit, Non Nasita 123 Size and Tears 131 Atalanta in Camden Town 136 The Lanka Orton 144 Riddles 152 Fames Penny Trumpet 163 Phantasmagoria Canto I The TRYSTYNG 1 Winter Night at half past nine, cold, tired, and cross, and muddy, I had come home, too late to dine, and supper, with cigars and wine, was waiting in the study. There was a strangeness in the room, and something white and wavy was standing near me in the gloom, I took it for the carpet broom left by that careless slavey. But presently the thing began to shiver and to sneeze, on which I said come, come, my man. That's a most inconsiderate plan. Less noise there, if you please. The thing standing by chair I've caught a cold the thing replies, out there upon the landing. I turned to look in some surprise, and there, before my very eyes, a little ghost was standing. He trembled when he caught my eye, and got behind a chair. How came you here I said, and why? I never saw a thing so shy. Come out. Don't shiver there. He said I'd gladly tell you how, and also tell you why, but, here he gave a little bow. You're in so bad a temper now, you'd think it all a lie. And as to being in a fright, allow me to remark that ghosts have just as good a right in every way, 
to fear the light, as men to fear the dark. No plea, said I, can well excuse such cowardice in you, for ghosts can visit when they choose, whereas we humans cant refuse to grant the interview. He said a flutter of alarm is not unnatural, is it? I really feared you meant some harm, but, now I see that you are calm, let me explain my visit. Houses are classed, I beg to state, according to the number of ghosts that they accommodate, the tenant merely counts as weight, with coals and other lumber. This is a one ghost house, and you when you arrived last summer, may have remarked a spectre who was doing all that ghosts can do to welcome the newcomer. In villas this is always done, however cheaply rented, for, though of course there's less of fun when there is only room for one, ghosts have to be contented. That spectre left you on the third, since then you've not been haunted, for, as he never sent us word. Twas quite by accident we heard that any one was wanted. A spectre has first choice, by right, in filling up a vacancy, then phantom, goblin, elf, and sprite, if all these fail them, they invite the nicest gal that they can see. The spectres said the place was low, and that you kept bad wine, so, as a phantom had to go, and I was first, of course, you know, I couldn't well decline. No doubt said I, they settled who was fittest to be sent yet still to choose a brat like you, to haunt a man of forty-two, was no great compliment. I'm not so young, sir he replied, as you might think. The fact is, in caverns by the waterside, and other places that I've tried, I've had a lot of practice, but I have never taken yet a strict domestic part, and in my flurry I forget the five good rules of etiquette we have to know by heart. My sympathies were warming fast towards the little fellow, he was so utterly aghast at having found a man at last, and looked so scared and yellow. In caverns by the waterside at least I said, I'm glad to find a ghost is not a dumb thing. But pray sit down, you'll feel inclined, if, like myself, you have not dined, to take a snack of something, though, certainly, you don't appear a thing to offer food to. And then I shall be glad to hear, if you will say them loud and clear the rules that you allude to. Thanks. You shall hear them by and by. This is a piece of luck. What may I offer you, said I well, since you are so kind, I'll try a little bit of duck. One slice. And may I ask you for another drop of gravy? I sat and looked at him in awe for certainly I never saw a thing so white and wavy. And still he seemed to grow more white, more vapory, and wavier, seen in the dim and flickering light, as he proceeded to recite his maxims of behavior. The Phantom Dines Canto 2 HYS 5 rules my first, but don't suppose he said, I'm setting you a riddle, is. If your victim be in bed, don't touch the curtains at his head, but take them in the middle, and wave them slowly in and out, while drawing them asunder, and in a minute's time, no doubt, he'll raise his head and look about with eyes of wrath and wonder. And here you must on no pretense make the first observation. Wait for the victim to commence. No ghost of any common sense begins a conversation. Ghostly border if he should say how came you here. 
The way that you began, sir, in such a case your course is clear, on the bat's back, my little dear, is the appropriate answer. If after this he says no more, you'd best perhaps curtail your exertions, go and shake the door, and then, if he begins to snore, you'll know the thing's a failure. By day, if he should be alone, at home or on a walk, you merely give a hollow groan, to indicate the kind of tone in which you mean to talk. But if you find him with his friends, the thing is rather harder. In such a case success depends on picking up some candle ends, or butter, in the larder. With this you make a kind of slide, it answers best with suet, on which you must contrive to glide, and swing yourself from side to side, one soon learns how to do it and swing yourself from side to side the second tells us what is right in ceremonious calls, first burn a blue or crimson light, a thing I quite forgot tonight, then scratch the door or walls. I said you'll visit here no more, if you attempt the guy. I'll have no bonfires on my floor, and, as for scratching at the door, I'd like to see you try. The third was written to protect the interests of the victim, and tells us, as I recollect, to treat him with a grave respect, and not to contradict him. That's plain said I, as tear and trit, to any comprehension, I only wish some ghosts I've met would not so constantly forget the maxim that you mention. Perhaps he said. You first transgressed the laws of hospitality, all ghosts instinctively detest the man that fails to treat his guest with proper cordiality. And then you're sure to catch it. If you address a ghost as thing, or strike him with a hatchet, he is permitted by the king to drop all formal parleying, and then you're sure to catch it. The fourth prohibits trespassing where other ghosts are quartered, and those convicted of the thing, unless when pardoned by the king, must instantly be slaughtered. That simply means be cut up small, ghosts soon unite anew. The process scarcely hurts at all, not more than when you re what you call cut up by a review. The fifth is one you may prefer that I should quote entire, the king must be addressed as sir. This, from a simple courtier, is all the laws require, but, should you wish to do the thing without an out politeness, accost him as my goblin king. And always use, in answering, the phrase your royal whiteness. I'm getting rather hoarse. I fear, after so much reciting, so, if you don't object, my dear, we'll try a glass of bitter beer, I think it looks inviting. We'll try a glass of bitter beer canto three skarmogs and did you really walk said I, on such a wretched night. I always fancied ghosts could fly, if not exactly in the sky yet at a fairish height. It's very well said he, for kings to soar above the earth, but phantoms often find that wings, like many other pleasant things, cost more than they are worth. Spectres of course are rich, and so can buy them from the elves, but we prefer to keep below, they are stupid company, you know, for any but themselves. For, though they claim to be exempt from pride, they treat a phantom as something quite beneath contempt, just as no turkey ever dreamt of noticing a bantam. The phantom they seem too proud, said I, to go to houses such as mine. Pray, 
How did they contrive to know so quickly that the place was low and that I kept bad wine? Inspector Cobbled came to you, the little ghost began. Here I broke in, Inspector Who. Inspecting ghosts is something new. Explain yourself, my man. His name is Cobbled said my guest, one of the Spectre Order. You'll very often see him dressed in a yellow gown, a crimson vest, and a nightcap with a border. He tried the Brocken business first, but caught a sort of chill, so came to England to be nursed, and here it took the form of thirst, which he complains of still. And here it took the form of thirst port wine, he says, when rich and sound warms his old bones like nectar, and as the inns, where it is found, are his especial hunting ground, we call him the inspector. I bore it, bore it like a man, this agonizing witticism. And nothing could be sweeter than my temper, till the ghost began some most provoking criticism. Cooks need not be indulged in waste. Yet still you'd better teach them dishes should have some sort of taste. Pray, why are all the cruets placed where nobody can reach them? That man of yours will never earn his living as a waiter. Is that queer thing supposed to burn? It's far too dismal a concern to call a moderator. The duck was tender. But the peas were very much too old, and just remember, if you please, the next time you have toasted cheese, don't let them send it cold. You'd find the bread improved, I think, by getting better flour, and have you anything to drink that looks a little less like ink, and isn't quite so sour. Then peering round with curious eyes, he muttered goodness gracious. And so went on to criticize, your room's an inconvenient size, it's neither snug nor spacious. That narrow window, I expect, serves but to let the dusk in, but please said I, to recollect twas fashioned by an architect who pinned his faith on Ruskin. I don't care who he was, sir, or on whom he pinned his faith. Constructed by whatever law, so poor a job I never saw, as I'm a living wraith. What a remarkable cigar! How much are they a dozen? I growled no matter what they are. You're getting as familiar as if you were my cousin. Now that's a thing I will not stand, and so I tell you flat. Aha, said he, we're getting grand. Taking a bottle in his hand, I'll soon arrange for that. And here he took a careful aim, and gaily cried here goes. I tried to dodge it as it came, but somehow caught it, all the same, exactly on my nose. And I remember nothing more that I can clearly fix, till I was sitting on the floor, repeating two and five are four, but five and two are six. What really passed I never learned, nor guessed, I only know that, when at last my sense returned, the lamp, neglected, dimly burned, the fire was getting low. Through driving mists I seemed to see a thing that smirked and smiled, and found that he was giving me a lesson in biography, as if I were a child. Canto 4 HYS Norituo, when I was a little ghost, a merry time had we. Each seated on his favorite post, we chumped and chawed the buttered toast they gave us for our tea. We chumped and chawed the buttered toast that story is in print. I cried. 
Don't say it's not, because it's known as well as Bradshaw's Guide. The ghost uneasily replied he hardly thought it was. It's not in nursery rhymes. And yet I almost think it is. Three little ghostesses were set on postesses you know, and ate their buttered toastesses. I have the book, so if you doubt it, I turn to search the shelf. Don't stir, he cried. We'll do without it, I now remember all about it, I wrote the thing myself. It came out in a monthly or at least my agent said it did, some literary swell, who saw it, thought it seemed adapted for the magazine he edited. My father was a brownie, sir, my mother was a fairy. The notion had occurred to her. The children would be happier, if they were taught to vary. The notion soon became a craze, and, when it once began, she brought us all out in different ways, one was a pixie, two were fays, another was a banshee, the fetch and kelpie went to school and gave a lot of trouble, next came a poltergeist and gowl, and then two trolls which broke the rule, a goblin, and a double, if that's a snuff box on the shelf he added with a yawn, I'll take a pinch, next came an elf, and then a phantom, that's myself, and last, a leprechaun. I stood and watched them in the hall one day, some spectres chanced to call, dressed in the usual white, I stood and watched them in the hall, and couldn't make them out at all, they seemed so strange a sight. I wondered what on earth they were, that looked all head and sack, but mother told me not to stare, and then she twitched me by the hair, and punched me in the back. Since then I've often wished that I had been a spectre born. But what's the use? He heaved a sigh. They are the ghost nobility, and look on us with scorn. My phantom life was soon begun, when I was barely six, I went out with an older one, and just at first I thought it fun, and learned a lot of tricks. I've haunted dungeons, castles, towers, wherever I was sent, I've often sat and howled for hours drenched to the skin with driving showers, upon a battlement. It's quite old-fashioned now to groan when you begin to speak, this is the newest thing in tone, and here, it chilled me to the bone, he gave an awful squeak. Perhaps he added, to your ear that sounds an easy thing. Try it yourself, my little dear. It took me something like a year, with constant practicing. And when you've learned to squeak, my man, and caught the double sob, you're pretty much where you began, just try and gibber if you can. That's something like a job. I've tried it, and can only say I'm sure you couldn't do it, even if you practiced night and day unless you have a turn that way, and natural ingenuity. Shakespeare I think it is who treats of ghosts, in days of old, who gibbered in the Roman streets dressed, if you recollect, in sheets, they must have found it cold. I've often spent ten pounds on stuff, in dressing as a double, but, though it answers as a puff, it never has effect enough to make it worth the trouble. In dressing as a double long bill soon quenched the little thirst I had for being funny. The setting up is always worst, such heaps of things you want at first, one must be made of money. For instance, take a haunted tower, with skull, crossbones, and sheet, blue lights to burn, say, 
to an hour, condensing lens of extra power, and set of chains complete, what with the things you have to hire, the fitting on the robe, and testing all the colored fire, the outfit of itself would tire the patience of a job. And then they are so fastidious, the haunted house committee, I've often known them make a fuss because a ghost was French, or Russ, or even from the city. Some dialects are objected to, for one, the Irish broke is, and then, for all you have to do, one pound a week they offer you, and find yourself in bogies. Canto V by comment don't they consult the victims though? I said. They should, by rights, give them a chance, because, you know, the tastes of people differ so, especially in sprites. The phantom shook his head and smiled. Consult them. Not a bit. Twould be a job to drive one wild, to satisfy one single child, there'd be no end to it. Of course you can't leave children free said I, to pick and choose, but, in the case of men like me, I think mine host might fairly be allowed to state his views. He said it really wouldn't pay, folk are so full of fancies. We visit for a single day, and whether then we go, or stay, depends on circumstances. And, though we don't consult mine host before the thing's arranged, still, if he often quits his post, or is not a well-mannered ghost, then you can have him changed. But if the host's a man like you, I mean a man of sense, and if the house is not too new, why, what has that said I, to do with ghost's convenience? A new house does not suit, you know, it's such a job to trim it, but, after twenty years or so, the wainscotings begin to go, so twenty is the limit. To trim was not a phrase I could remember having heard, perhaps I said, you'll be so good as tell me what is understood exactly by that word. The wainscotings begin to go it means the loosening all the doors the ghost replied, and laughed, it means the drilling holes by scores in all the skirting boards and floors, to make a thorough draft. You'll sometimes find that one or two are all you really need to let the wind come whistling through, but here there'll be a lot to do. I faintly gasped indeed. If I'd been rather later, I'll be bound I added, trying, most unsuccessfully, to smile, you'd have been busy all this while, trimming and beautifying. Why, no said he, perhaps I should have stayed another minute, but still no ghost, that's any good, without an introduction would have ventured to begin it. The proper thing, as you were late, was certainly to go, but, with the roads in such a state, I got the night mayor's leave to wait for half an hour or so. Who's the night mayor? I cried. Instead of answering my question, well, if you don't know that he said, either you never go to bed, or you've a grand digestion. He goes about and sits on folk that eat too much at night, his duties are to pinch, and poke, and squeeze them till they nearly choke. I said it serves them right. And folk who sup on things like these, he muttered, eggs and bacon, lobster, and duck, and toasted cheese, if they don't get an awful squeeze, I'm very much mistaken. He is immensely fat, and so well suits the occupation, in point of fact, if you must know, 
we used to call him years ago, the mayor and corporation. He goes about and sits on folk the day he was elected mayor I know that every sprite meant to vote for me, but did not dare, he was so frantic with despair and furious with excitement. He ran to tell the king when it was over, for a whim, he ran to tell the king, and being the reverse of slim, a two-mile trot was not for him a very easy thing. So, to reward him for his run, as it was baking hot, and he was over twenty stone, the king proceeded, half in fun, to knight him on the spot. Twas a great liberty to take. I fired up like a rocket. He did it just for punning sake, the man says Johnson, that would make a pun, would pick a pocket. A man said he, is not a king. I argued for a while, and did my best to prove the thing, the phantom merely listening with a contemptuous smile. At last, when, breath and patience spent, I had recourse to smoking, your aim he said, is excellent, but, when you call it argument, of course you're only joking. The phantom sitting on chair stung by his cold and snaky eye, I roused myself at length to say at least I do defy the veriest skeptic to deny that union is strength. That's true enough said he, yet stay, I listened in all meekness, union is strength, I'm bound to say, in fact, the thing's as clear as day, but onions are a weakness. Canto 6 Discomfiture as one who strives a hill to climb, who never climbed before, who finds it, in a little time, grow every moment less sublime, and votes the thing a bore, yet, having once begun to try, dares not desert his quest, but, climbing, ever keeps his eye on one small hut against the sky wherein he hopes to rest who climbs till nerve and force are spent, with many a puff and pant, who still, as rises the ascent, in language grows more violent, although in breath more scant, who, climbing, gains at length the place that crowns the upward track, and, entering with unsteady pace, receives a buffet in the face that lands him on his back decorative border of man climbing hall and feels himself, like one in sleep, glide swiftly down again, a helpless weight, from steep to steep, till, with a headlong giddy sweep, he drops upon the plain, so I, that had resolved to bring conviction to a ghost, and found it quite a different thing from any human arguing yet dared not quit my post but, keeping still the end in view to which I hoped to come. I strove to prove the matter true by putting everything I knew into an axiom, commencing every single phrase with therefore or because I blindly reeled, a hundred ways, about the syllogistic maze, unconscious where I was. Quoth he that's regular clap trap, don't bluster any more. Now do be cool and take a nap. Such a ridiculous old chap was never seen before. You're like a man I used to meet, who got one day so furious in arguing, the simple heat scorched both his slippers off his feet. I said that's very curious. Scorched both his slippers off his feet well, it is curious, I agree, and sounds perhaps like fibs, but still it's true as true can be, as sure as your name's types said he. I said my name's not types. Not types, he cried, his tone became a shade or two less hearty, why, 
No said I my proper name is Tibets, Tibets. I, the same. Why, then you're not the party. With that he struck the board a blow that shivered half the glasses. Why couldn't you have told me so three quarters of an hour ago, you prince of all the asses? To walk four miles through mud and rain, to spend the night in smoking, and then to find that it's in vain, and I've to do it all again, it's really too provoking. Don't talk, he cried, as I began to mutter some excuse. Who can have patience with a man that's got no more discretion than an idiotic goose? To walk four miles through mud and rain to keep me waiting here, instead of telling me at once that this was not the house, he said. There, that'll do, be off to bed. Don't gape like that, you dunce. It's very fine to throw the blame on me in such a fashion. Why didn't you enquire my name the very minute that you came? I answered in a passion. Of course it worries you a bit to come so far on foot, but how was I to blame for it? Well, well, said he. I must admit that isn't badly put. And certainly you've given me the best of wine and victual, excuse my violence said he, but accidents like this, you see, they put one out a little. Twas my fault after all, I find, shake hands, old turnip top. The name was hardly to my mind, but, as no doubt he meant it kind, I let the matter drop. Good night, old turnip top, good night. When I am gone, perhaps they'll send you some inferior sprite, who'll keep you in a constant fright and spoil your soundest naps. Tell him you'll stand no sort of trick, then, if he leers and chuckles, you just be handy with a stick, mind that it's pretty hard and thick and wrap him on the knuckles. Then carelessly remark old coon. Perhaps you're not aware that, if you don't behave, you'll soon be chuckling to another tune, and so you'd best take care. That's the right way to cure a sprite of such like goings on, but gracious me. It's getting light. Good night. Old Turnip Top, good night. A nod, and he was gone. The ghost canto seven sad souvenirs, or can I have been drinking what's this? I pondered. Have I slept? Or can I have been drinking? But soon a gentler feeling crept upon me, and I sat and wept an hour or so, like winking. No need for bones to hurry so. I sobbed. In fact, I doubt if it was worth his while to go, and who is types, I'd like to know, to make such work about. If types is anything like me, it's possible I said, he won't be over pleased to be dropped in upon at half past three, after he's snug in bed. And if Bones plagues him anyhow, squeaking and all the rest of it, as he was doing here just now, I prophesy there'll be a row, and Types will have the best of it. And Types will have the best of it then, as my tears could never bring the friendly phantom back, it seemed to me the proper thing to mix another glass, and sing the following coronic. And art thou gone? Beloved ghost. Best of familiars. Nay then, farewell, my duckling roast, farewell, farewell, my tea and toast, my mere show and cigars. The hues of life are dull and grey, 
The sweets of life insipid, when thou, my charmer, art away, old brick, or rather, let me say, old parallelopipped. Instead of singing verse the third, I ceased, abruptly, rather, but, after such a splendid word I felt that it would be absurd to try it any farther. So with a yawn I went my way to seek the welcome downy, and slept, and dreamed till break of day of poltergeist and fetch and fay and leprechaun and brownie. For years I've not been visited by any kind of sprite, yet still they echo in my head, those parting words, so kindly said, old turnip top, good night. The ghost echoes Lady Clara Vere de Vere was eight years old, she said, every ringlet, lightly shaken, ran itself in golden thread. She took her little porringer. Of me she shall not win renown, for the baseness of its nature shall have strength to drag her down. Sisters and brothers, little maid. There stands the inspector at thy door, like a dog, he hunts for boys who know not two and two are four. Kind words are more than coronets she said, and wondering looked at me. It is the dead unhappy night, and I must hurry home to tea. A sea dirge the sea, beach and children there are certain things, as, a spider, a ghost, the income tax, gout, an umbrella for three, that I hate, but the thing that I hate the most is a thing they call the sea. Pour some salt water over the floor. Ugly I'm sure you'll allow it to be, suppose it extended a mile or more, that's very like the sea. Beat a dog till it howls outright, cruel, but all very well for a spree, suppose that he did so day and night, that would be like the sea. I had a vision of nursery maids, tens of thousands passed by me all leading children with wooden spades, and this was by the sea. Who invented those spades of wood? Who was it cut them out of the tree? None, I think, but an idiot could, or one that loved the sea. It is pleasant and dreamy, no doubt, to float with thoughts as boundless, and souls as free, but... Suppose you are very unwell in the boat, how do you like the sea? And this was by the sea there is an insect that people avoid, whence is derived the verb to flee. Where have you been by it most annoyed? In lodgings by the sea. If you like your coffee with sand for dregs, a decided hint of salt in your tea, and a fishy taste in the very eggs, by all means choose the sea. And if, with these dainties to drink and eat, you prefer not a vestige of grass or tree, and a chronic state of wet in your feet, then, I recommend the sea. For I have friends who dwell by the coast, pleasant friends they are to me. It is when I am with them I wonder most that anyone likes the sea. They take me a walk, though tired and stiff, to climb the heights I madly agree, and, after a tumble or so from the cliff, they kindly suggest the sea. I try the rocks, and I think it cool that they laugh with such an excess of glee, as I heavily slip into every pool that skirts the cold cold sea. As I heavily slip into every pool ye carpet knit I have a horse, a writ good horse, any do y n vi those who scour ye plain y n heady course t y l l sodane on their nose they light w y t h unexpected force y t y s, a horse of clothes. I have a saddle, say s t thou so. w y t h stirrups knit, to boot. 
I said not that, I answer anew, why he lacketh such, I woot, why he why a mutton saddle, Louis. Party of ye fleecy brute. I have a bit, a writ good bit, as shall be seen why in time. Ye jaw of horse white e w y l l not fight, white e s use y s more sublime. Fair air s y r, how deemest thou of white e? White e y s, thy spit of rhyme. I have a horse higher wealth as photographing, in an age of imitation, I can claim no special merit for this slight attempt at doing what is known to be so easy. Any fairly practiced writer, with the slightest ear for rhythm, could compose, for hours together, in the easy running meter of the song of Hiawatha. Having, then, Distinctly stated that I challenge no attention in the following little poem to its merely verbal jingle, I must beg the candid reader to confine his criticism to its treatment of the subject. Dot. From his shoulder Hiawatha took the camera of rosewood, made of sliding, folding rosewood, neatly put it all together. In its case it lay compactly folded into nearly nothing, but he opened out the hinges, pushed and pulled the joints and hinges, till it looked all squares and oblongs, like a complicated figure in the second book of Euclid. The camera this he perched upon a tripod, crouched beneath its dusky cover, stretched his hand, enforcing silence, said, Be motionless. I beg you. Mystic, awful was the process. All the family in order sat before him for their pictures, each in turn, as he was taken, volunteered his own suggestions, his ingenious suggestions. First the governor, the father, he suggested velvet curtains looped about a massy pillar, and the corner of a table of a rosewood dining table. He would hold a scroll of something, hold it firmly in his left hand, he would keep his right hand buried, like Napoleon, in his waistcoat, he would contemplate the distance with a look of pensive meaning, as of ducks that dial tempests. Grand, heroic was the notion, yet the picture failed entirely failed, because he moved a little, moved, because he couldn't help it. First the governor, the father next, his better half took courage, she would have her picture taken. She came dressed beyond description, dressed in jewels and in satin far too gorgeous for an empress. Gracefully she sat down sideways with a simper scarcely human, holding in her hand a bouquet rather larger than a cabbage. All the while that she was sitting, still the lady chattered, chattered, like a monkey in the forest. Am I sitting still? she asked him. Is my face enough in profile? Shall I hold the bouquet higher? Will it came into the picture. And the picture failed completely. Next the sun, the stunning cantab next the sun, the stunning cantab, he suggested curves of beauty, curves pervading all his figure, which the eye might follow onward, till they centered in the breast pin, centered in the golden breast pin. He had learnt it all from Ruskin, author of The Stones of Venice Seven Lamps of Architecture Modern Painters and some others, and perhaps he had not fully understood his author's meaning, but, whatever was the reason, all was fruitless, as the picture ended in an utter failure. Next to him the eldest daughter next to him the eldest daughter, 
She suggested very little, only asked if he would take her with her look of passive beauty. Her idea of passive beauty was a squinting of the left eye, was a drooping of the right eye, was a smile that went up sideways to the corner of the nostrils. Hiawatha, when she asked him, took no notice of the question, looked as if he hadn't heard it, but, when pointedly appealed to, smiled in his peculiar manner, coughed and said it didn't matter bit his lip and changed the subject. Nor in this was he mistaken, as the picture failed completely. So in turn the other sisters. Last. The youngest son was taken last, the youngest son was taken, very rough and thick his hair was, very round and red his face was, very dusty was his jacket, very fidgety his manner. And his overbearing sisters called him names he disapproved of, called him Johnny, Daddy's darling called him Jackie, scrubby schoolboy. And, so awful was the picture, in comparison the others seemed, to one's bewildered fancy, to have partially succeeded. Finally my higher wealth tumbled all the tribe together, grouped is not the right expression, and, as happy chance would have it did at last obtain a picture where the faces all succeeded, each came out a perfect likeness. Then they joined and all abused it, unrestrainedly abused it, as the worst and ugliest picture they could possibly have dreamed of. Giving one such strange expressions, sullen, stupid, pert expressions. Really anyone would take us, anyone that did not know us, for the most unpleasant people. Hiawatha seemed to think so, seemed to think it not unlikely. All together rang their voices, angry, loud, discordant voices, as of dogs that howl in concert, as of cats that wail in chorus. But my Hiawatha's patience, his politeness and his patience, unaccountably had vanished, and he left that happy party. Neither did he leave them slowly, with the calm deliberation, the intense deliberation of a photographic artist, but he left them in a hurry, left them in a mighty hurry, stating that he would not stand it, stating in emphatic language what he'd be before he'd stand it. Hurriedly he packed his boxes. Hurriedly the porter trundled on a barrow all his boxes, hurriedly he took his ticket, hurriedly the train received him, thus departed Hiawatha. Thus departed Hiawatha. Melancholetta with saddest music all day long she soothed her secret sorrow, at night she sighed I fear twas wrong such cheerful words to borrow. Dearest, a sweeter, sadder song I'll sing to thee tomorrow. I thanked her, but I could not say that I was glad to hear it. I left the house at break of day, and did not venture near it till time, I hoped, had worn away her grief, for naught could cheer it. At night she signed my dismal sister. Couldst thou know the wretched home thou keepest? Thy brother, drowned in daily woe, is thankful when thou sleepest, for if I laugh, however low, when thou art he awake, thou weepest. I took my sister tea other day, excuse the slang expression, to Sadler's Wells to see the play in hopes the new impression might in her thoughts from grave to gay effect some slight digression. I asked three gay young dogs from town to join us in our folly, whose mirth, I thought, might serve to drown my sister's melancholy, 
the lively Jones, the sportive Brown, and Robinson the jolly. The maid announced the meal in tones that I myself had taught her, meant to allay my sister's moans like oil on troubled water, I rushed to Jones, the lively Jones, and begged him to escort her. Vainly he strove, with ready wit, to joke about the weather, to ventilate the last on it, to quote the price of leather, she groaned here I and sorrow sit, let us lament together. I urged your wasting time, you know, delay will spoil the venison. My heart is wasted with my woe. There is no rest, in Venice, on the bridge of sighs, she quoted low from Byron and from Tennyson. I need not tell of soup and fish in solemn silence swallowed, the sobs that ushered in each dish, and its departure followed, nor yet my suicidal wish to be the cheese I hollowed. Some desperate attempts were made to start a conversation, Madam the sportive brown essayed, which kind of recreation, hunting or fishing, have you made your special occupation? Her lips curved downwards instantly, as if of India rubber. Hounds in full cry I like said she, oh how I longed to snub her. A fish, a whale's the one for me, it is so full of blubber. The night's performance was King John. It's dull she wept, and so-so. A while I let her tears flow on. She said they soothed her woe so. At length the curtain rose upon Bombastes Furioso. In vain we roared, in vain we tried to rouse her into laughter, her pensive glances wandered wide from orchestra to rafter, tear upon tear, she said, and sighed, and silence followed after. Sighing at the table of Valentine, sent to a friend who had complained that I was glad enough to see him when he came, but didn't seem to miss him if he stayed away. Dot. And cannot pleasures, while they last, be actual unless, when past, they leave us shuddering and aghast, with anguish smarting? And cannot friends be firm and fast, and yet bear parting? And must I then, at friendship's call, calmly resign the little all, trifling, I grant, it is and small, I have of gladness, and lend my being to the thrall of gloom and sadness. And think you that I should be dumb, and full dolorum omnium, excepting when you choose to come and share my dinner. At other times be sour and glum and daily thinner. Must he then only live to weep, who'd prove his friendship true and deep by day a lonely shadow creep, at night time languish, oft raising in his broken sleep the moan of anguish. The lover, if for certain days his fair one be denied his gaze, sinks not in grief and wild amaze. But, wiser wooer, he spends the time in writing lays, and posts them to her. And if the verse flow free and fast, till even the poet is aghast, a touching valentine at last the post shall carry, when thirteen days are gone and past of February. Farewell, dear friend, and when we meet, in desert waste or crowded street, Perhaps before this week shall fleet, perhaps tomorrow. I trust to find your heart the seat of wasting sorrow. The three voices the first voice he trilled a carol fresh and free, he laughed aloud for very glee, there came a breeze from off the sea, there came a breeze from off the sea it passed athwart the glooming flat, it fanned his forehead as he sat. It lightly bore away his hat, 
all to the feet of one who stood like maid enchanted in a wood, frowning as darkly as she could. With a huge umbrella, lank and brown, unerringly she pinned it down, right through the center of the crown. Then, with an aspect cold and grim, regardless of its battered rim, she took it up and gave it him. A while like one in dreams he stood, then faltered forth his gratitude in words just short of being rude, for it had lost its shape and shine, and it had cost him four and nine, and he was going out to dine. Unerringly she pinned it down to dine, she sneered in acid tone. To bend thy being to a bone clothed in a radiance not its own. The teardrop trickled to his chin, there was a meaning in her grin that made him feel on fire within. Term it not radiance said he, tea's solid nutriment to me. Dinner is dinner, tea is tea. And she yes so. Yet wherefore cease? Let thy scant knowledge find increase. Say men are men and geese are geese. He moaned, he knew not what to say. The thought that I could get away. Strove with the thought but I must stay. To dine, she shrieked in dragon wrath. To swallow wines all foam and froth. To simper at a table cloth. Say, can thy noble spirit stoop to join the gormandizing troop who find a solace in the soup? Canst thou desire or pie or puff? Thy well-bred manners were enough, without such gross material stuff. Yet well-bred men, he faintly said, are not willing to be fed, nor are they well without the bread. Her visage scorched him ere she spoke, there are she said, a kind of folk who have no horror of a joke. Such wretches live, they take their share of common earth and common air, we come across them here and there, we grant them, there is no escape, a sort of semi-human shape suggestive of the man-like ape. In all such theories said he, one fixed exception there must be. That is, the present company. Baffled, she gave a wolfish bark, he, aiming blindly in the dark, with random shaft had pierced the mark. She felt that her defeat was plain, yet madly strove with might and main to get the upper hand again. Fixing her eyes upon the beach, as though unconscious of his speech, she said each gives to more than each. He could not answer yea or nay, he faltered gifts may pass away. Yet knew not what he meant to say. If that be so she straight replied, each heart with each doth coincide. What boots it? For the world is wide. He faltered gifts may pass away the world is but a thought said he, the vast unfathomable sea is but a notion, unto me. And darkly fell her answer dread upon his unresisting head, like half a hundredweight of lead. The good and great must ever shun that reckless and abandoned one who stoops to perpetrate a pun. The man that smokes that reads the times, that goes to Christmas pantomimes, is capable of any crimes. He felt it was his turn to speak, and, with a shamed and crimson cheek, moaned this is harder than bazique. But when she asked him wherefore so, he felt his very whiskers glow, and frankly owned I do not know. This is harder than bazique. While, like broad waves of golden grain, or sunlit hues on cloistered pane, 
his color came and went again. Pitying his obvious distress, yet with a tinge of bitterness, she said the more exceeds the less. A truth of such undoubted weight he urged, and so extreme in date, it were superfluous to state. Roused into sudden passion, she in tone of cold malignity, to others, yet, but not to thee. But when she saw him quail and quake, and when he urged for pity's sake, once more in gentle tones she spake. Thought in the mind doth still abide that is by intellect supplied, and within that idea doth hide, and he, that yearns the truth to know, still further inwardly may go, and find idea from notion flow, and thus the chain, that sages sought, is to a glorious circle wrought, for notion of its source in thought. So passed they on with even pace, yet gradually one might trace a shadow growing on his face. A shadow growing on his face the second voice they walked beside the wave-worn beach they walked beside the wave-worn beach, her tongue was very apt to teach, and now and then he did beseech she would abate her dulcet tone, because the talk was all her own, and he was dull as any drone. She urged no cheese is made of chalk, and ceaseless flowed her dreary talk tuned to the footfall of a walk. Her voice was very full and rich, and, when at length she asked him which, it mounted to its highest pitch. He a bewildered answer gave, drowned in the sullen moaning wave, lost in the echoes of the cave. He answered her he knew not what, like shaft from bow at random shot. He spoke, but she regarded not. She waited not for his reply, but with a downward leaden eye went on as if he were not by sound argument and grave defence, strange questions raised on why, and whence, and wildly tangled evidence. When he, with racked and whirling brain, feebly implored her to explain, she simply said it all again. Wrenched with an agony intense, he spake, neglecting sound and sense, and careless of all consequence, mind, I believe, is essence, ent, abstract, that is, an accident, which we, that is to say, I meant, when, with quick breath and cheeks all flushed, at length his speech was somewhat hushed, she looked at him, and he was crushed. It needed not her calm reply, she fixed him with a stony eye, and he could neither fight nor fly. While she dissected, word by word, his speech, half guessed at and half heard, as might a cat a little bird. He spake neglecting sound and sense then, having wholly overthrown his views, and stripped them to the bone, proceeded to unfold her own. Shall man be man? And shall he miss of other thoughts no thought but this, harmonious dues of sober bliss? What boots it? Shall his fever die through towering nothingness descry the grisly phantom hurry by? And hear dumb shrieks that fill the air, see mouths that gape, and eyes that stare and redden in the dusky glare. The meadows breathing amber light, the darkness toppling from the height, the feathery train of granite night. Shall he, grown grey among his peers? Through the thick curtain of his tears catch glimpses of his earlier years, shall man be man. And hear the sounds he knew of your old shufflings on the sanded floor, old knuckles tapping at the door. Yet still before him as he flies one pallid form shall ever rise, and, 
bodying forth in glassy eyes the vision of a vanished good, low peering through the tangled wood, shall freeze the current of his blood. Still from each fact, with skill uncouth and savage rapture, like a tooth she wrenched some slow reluctant truth. Till, like a silent water mill, when summer suns have dried the rill, she reached a full stop, and was still. Dead calm succeeded to the fuss, as when the loaded omnibus has reached the railway terminus, when, for the tumult of the street, is heard the engine's stifled beat, the velvet tread of porter's feet. With glance that ever sought the ground, she moved her lips without a sound, and every now and then she frowned. He gazed upon the sleeping sea, and joyed in its tranquility, and in that silence dead, but she to muse a little space did seem, then, like the echo of a dream, harked back upon her threadbare theme. Still an attentive ear he lent but could not fathom what she meant, she was not deep, nor eloquent. He marked the ripple on the sand, the even swaying of her hand was all that he could understand. He saw in dreams a drawing room, where thirteen wretches sat in gloom, waiting, he thought he knew for whom, he saw them drooping here and there each feebly huddled on a chair, in attitudes of blank despair, oysters were not more mute than they, for all their brains were pumped away, and they had nothing more to say, save one, who groaned three hours are gone. Who shrieked we'll wait no longer, John. Tell them to set the dinner on. The vision passed, the ghosts were fled. He saw once more that woman dread, he heard once more the words she said. He left her, and he turned aside, he sat and watched the coming tide across the shores so newly dried. He sat and watched the coming tide he wondered at the waters clear, the breeze that whispered in his ear, the billows heaving far and near and why he had so long preferred to hang upon her every word, in truth he said, it was absurd. He sits the third voice quick tears were raining down his face not long this transport held its place, within a little moment's space quick tears were raining down his face his heart stood still, aghast with fear, a wordless voice, nor far nor near. He seemed to hear and not to hear. Tears kindle not the doubtful spark. If so, why not? Of this remark the bearings are profoundly dark. Her speech, he said, hath caused this pain. Easier I count it to explain the jargon of the howling main, or, stretched beside some babbling brook, to con with inexpressive look, an unintelligible book. Lo spake the voice within his head, in words imagined more than said, soundless as ghosts intended tread, if thou art duller than before, why quittedst thou the voice of law? Why not endure, expecting more? Rather than that he groaned aghast, I'd writhe in depths of cavern vast some loathly vampire's rich repast. He groaned aghast twere hard it answered, themes immense to coop within the narrow fence that rings thy scant intelligence. Not so he urged, nor once alone, but there was something in her tone that chilled me to the very bone. Her style was anything but clear, and most unpleasantly severe. Her epithets were very queer. And yet, so grand were her replies, I could not choose but deem her wise, I did not dare to criticize, nor did I leave her, till she went so deep in tangled argument that all my powers of thought were spent.
A little whisper inly slid, yet truth is truth, you know you did. A little wink beneath the lid. And, sickened with excess of dread, prone to the dust he bent his head, and lay like one three quarters dead the whisper left him, like a breeze lost in the depths of leafy trees, left him by no means at his ease. Once more he weltered in despair, with hands, through denser matted hair, more tightly clenched than then they were. When, bathed in dawn of living red, majestic frowned the mountain head, tell me my fault was all he said. When, at high noon, the blazing sky scorched in his head each haggard eye, then keenest rose his weary cry. And when at eve the unpitying sun smiled grimly on the solemn fun, alack he sighed, what have I done? Tortured, unaided, and alone but saddest, darkest was the sight, when the cold grasp of leaden night dashed him to earth, and held him tight. Tortured, unaided, and alone, thunders were silence to his groan bagpipes sweet music to its tone, what? Ever thus, in dismal round, shall pain and mystery profound pursue me like a sleepless hound, with crimson dashed and eager jaws, me, still in ignorance of the cause, unknowing what I broke of laws. The whisper to his ear did seem like echoed flow of silent stream, or shadow of forgotten dream. The whisper trembling in the wind, her fate with thine was intertwined so spake it in his inner mind, a scared dullard, gibbering low each orbed on each a baleful star, each proved the other's blight and bar, each unto each were best, most far, yet, each to each was worse than foe, thou, a scared dullard, gibbering low, and she, an avalanche of woe. To Macon Verizioni, why is it that poetry has never yet been subjected to that process of dilution which has proved so advantageous to her sister art music? The diluter gives us first a few notes of some well-known air, then a dozen bars of his own, then a few more notes of the air, and so on alternately, thus saving the listener if not from all risk of recognizing the melody at all, at least from the two exciting transports which it might produce in a more concentrated form. The process is termed setting by composers, and anyone that has ever experienced the emotion of being unexpectedly set down in a heap of mortar, will recognize the truthfulness of this happy phrase. For truly, just as the genuine epicure lingers lovingly over a morsel of supreme venison, whose every fiber seems to murmur excelsior, yet swallows, ere returning to the toothsome dainty, great mouthfuls of oatmeal porridge and winkles, and just as the perfect connoisseur in claret permits himself but one delicate sip, and then tosses off a pint or more of boarding school beer, so also, I never loved a dear gazelle, nor anything that cost me much, high prices profit those who sell, but why should I be fond of such? To glad me with his soft black eye my son comes trotting home from school, he's had a fight but can't tell why, he always was a little fool. But, when he came to know me well, he kicked me out, her testy sire, and when I stained my hair, that Belle might note the change, and thus admire and love me, it was sure to dye a muddy green or staring blue whilst one might trace, with half an eye, the still triumphant carrot through. A game of fives five little girls five little girls, of five, four, three, two, one, 
rolling on the hearth rug, full of tricks and fun. Five rosy girls, in years from ten to six, sitting down to lessons, no more time for tricks. Five growing girls, from fifteen to eleven, music, drawing, languages, and food enough for seven. Now tell me which you mean five winsome girls, from twenty to sixteen, each young man that calls, I say now tell me which you mean. Five dashing girls, the youngest twenty-one, but, if nobody proposes, what is there to be done? Five showy girls, but thirty is an age when girls may be engaging but they somehow don't engage. Five dressy girls, of thirty-one or more, so gracious to the shy young men they snubbed so much before. Asterisk 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 five pass girls, their age. Well, never mind. We jog along together, like the rest of humankind. But the Quindam careless bachelor begins to think he knows the answer to that ancient problem how the money goes. Poet of fit, non nascit a child on an old man's knee how shall I be a poet? How shall I write in rhyme? You told me once the very wish partook of the sublime. Then tell me how. Don't put me off with your another time. The old man smiled to see him, to hear his sudden sally, he liked the lad to speak his mind enthusiastically, and thought there's no humdrum in him, nor any shilly shally. And would you be a poet before you've been to school? Ah, well. I hardly thought you so absolute a fool. First learn to be spasmodic, a very simple rule. For first you write a sentence, and then you chop it small, then mix the bits, and sort them out just as they chance to fall, the order of the phrases makes no difference at all. Then, if you'd be impressive, remember what I say, that abstract qualities begin with capitals alway. The true, the good, the beautiful, those are the things that pay. Next, when you are describing a shape, or sound, or tint, don't state the matter plainly, but put it in a hint, and learn to look at all things with a sort of mental squint. For instance, if I wished, sir, of mutton pies to tell, should I say dreams of fleecy flocks pent in a wheaten cell? Why, yes the old man said, that phrase would answer very well. Then fourthly, there are epithets that suit with any word, as well as Harvey's reading sauce with fish, or flesh, or bird, of these, wild lonely weary strange are much to be preferred. And will it do? Oh will it do to take them in a lump, as the wild man went his weary way to a strange and lonely pump? Nay, nay. You must not hastily to such conclusions jump. The wild man went his weary way such epithets, like pepper, give zest to what you write, and, if you strew them sparely, they wet the appetite. But if you lay them on too thick, you spoil the matter quite. Last, as to the arrangement, your reader, you should show him, must take what information he can get, and look for no immature disclosure of the drift and purpose of your poem. Therefore, to test his patience, how much he can endure, mention no places, names, or dates, and evermore be sure throughout the poem to be found consistently obscure. 
first fix upon the limit to which it shall extend, then fill it up with padding, beg some of any friend your great sensation stanza you place towards the end. And what is a sensation, grandfather, tell me, pray. I think I never heard the word so used before today, be kind enough to mention one exemplary gracia. And the old man, looking sadly across the garden lawn, where here and there a dewdrop yet glittered in the dawn, said go to the Adelphi, and see the Colleen born. The word is due to Boussacolt, the theory is his, where life becomes a spasm and history a whiz, if that is not sensation, I don't know what it is. Now try your hand, ere fancy have lost its present glow, and then his grandson added, we'll publish it, you know, green cloth, gold lettered at the back, in duodsimo. Then proudly smiled that old man to see the eager lad rush madly for his pen and ink and for his blotting pad, but, when he thought of publishing, his face grew stern and sad. His face grew stern and sad sighs and tears when on the sandy shore I sit when on the sandy shore I sit, beside the salt sea wave and fall into a weeping fit because I dare not shave, a little whisper at my ear enquires the reason of my fear. I answer if that ruffian Jones should recognize me here, he'd bellow out my name in tones offensive to the ear, he chaffs me so on being stout, a thing that always puts me out, dot. Ah me. I see him on the cliff. Farewell, farewell to hope, if he should look this way, and if he's got his telescope. To whatsoever place I flee, my odious rival follows me. For every night, and everywhere, I meet him out at dinner, and when I've found some charming fair, and vowed to die or win her, the wretch, he's thin and I am stout is sure to come and cut me out. He's thin and I am stout the girls, just like them, all agree to praise J. Jones, Esquire, I ask them what on earth they see about him to admire. They cry he is so sleek and slim, it's quite a treat to look at him. They vanish in tobacco smoke, those visionary maids. I feel a sharp and sudden poke between the shoulder blades, why, Brown, my boy, you're growing stout. I told you he would find me out. My growth is not your business, sir. No more it is, my boy. But if it's yours, as I infer, why, Brown, I give you joy. A man whose business prospers so, is just the sort of man to know. It's hardly safe, though, talking here, I'd best get out of reach, for such a weight as yours, I fear, must shortly sink the beach. Insult me thus because I'm stout. I vow I'll go and call him out. For such a weight as yours. Atalanta in Camden Town, eh? Twas here, on this spot, in that summer of yore, Atalanta did not vote my presence a bore, nor reply to my tenderest talk. She had heard all that nonsense before. She'd the brooch I had bought and the necklace and sash on, and her heart, as I thought, was alive to my passion and she'd done up her hair in the style that the Empress had brought into fashion. I had been to the play with my pearl of a peery, but, for all I could say, she declared she was weary, that the place was so crowded and hot, and she couldn't abide that dundreary. On this spot. Then I thought lucky boy. 
tease for you that she whimpers. And I noted with joy those sensational simpers, and I said this is scrumptious. A phrase I had learned from the Devonshire shrimpers. And I vowed twill be said I'm a fortunate fellow, when the breakfast is spread, when the topas are mellow, when the foam of the bride cake is white, and the fierce orange blossoms are yellow. Oh that languishing yawn! Oh those eloquent eyes! I was drunk with the dawn of a splendid surmise, I was stung by a look, I was slain by a tear by a tempest of sighs. Then I whispered I see the sweet secret thou keepest, and the yearning for me that thou wistfully weepest. And the question is license or bans, though undoubtedly bans are the cheapest. Be my hero, said I, and let me be lender. But I lost her reply, something ending with gander for the omnibus rattled so loud that no mortal could quite understand her. The lanker autumn the lady she stood at her lattice high, we her doggy at her feet, thorough the lattice she can spy the passers in the street, there's one that standeth at the door, and turleth at the pin, now speak and say, my Pope in Jay, if I shall let him in. Then up and spake the Pope in Jay that flew abune her head, Gay let him in that turls the pin, he cometh thee to wed. Oh when he came the parlour in, a woeful man was he. And dinner ye ken your lover a gen, essay well that loveth thee. The Pope in Jay and how would I ken ye loved me, sir, that have been essay lang away. And how would I ken ye loved me, sir? Ye never telled me essay. Said, Lady dear and the salt, salt tear Cameron in dune his cheek, I have sent the tokens of my love this many and many a week. Oh didna ye get the rings, lady, the rings o' oh, the gowd essay fine. I wot that I have sent to thee four score, Four score and nine. They come to me, said that fair lady. Well, they were flimsy things. Said, that chain o' oh, gowd, my doggy to howd, it is made o' oh, they self same rings. And didna ye get the locks, the locks, the locks o' oh, my ain black hair, whilk I sent by post, whilk I sent by box. While I sent by the carrier. They come to me, said that fair lady, and I prithee send name there. Said, that cushion essay red, for my doggy's head, it is stuffed with a locks o' hair. And didna ye get the letter, lady, tied we a silken string, while I sent to thee fray the far country, a message of love to bring. It came to me fray the far country we its silken string under, but it wasna prepaid said that high-born maid, S.A.E. I guardee them tack it awa. Oh ever lack that ye sent it back, it was written S.A.E. clerkly and well. Now the message it brought, and the boon that it sought, I must even say it missile. Then up and spake the Pope in J. Essay wisely counselled he. Now say it in the proper way, gay dune upon thy knee. The lover he turned bay thread and pale, went dune upon his knee, O lady, hear the wassum tale that must be told to thee. For five lang years, and five lang years, I courted thee by looks, by nods and winks, by smiles and tears, as I had read in books. For ten lang years, O oh weary hours! I courted thee by signs, by sending game, by sending flowers, by sending valentines. For five lang years, 
and five lang years, I have dwelt in the far country, till that thy mind should be inclined mere tenderly to me. Now thirty years are gain and past, I am come frae a foreign land, I am come to tell thee my love at last, O lady, guy me thy hand. The lady she turned not pale nor red, but she smiled a pitiful smile, sick a coorten as yours, my man she said takes a lang and a weary while. And out and laughed the Pope in J, and out and laughed the Pope in J, a laugh of bitter scorn, a coorten done in sick a way, it ought not to be borne. With that the doggy barked aloud, and up and doon he ran, and tugged and strained his chain o oh gout, all for to bite the man. O oh hush thee, gentle Pope in J. O oh hush thee, doggy dear. There is a word I fain would say, it needeth he should hear. I louder screamed that lady fair to drown her doggy's bark, ever the lover shouted mare to make that lady hark, shrill and more shrill the Pope in J upraised his angry squall, I trow the doggy's voice that day was louder than them all. Oh hush thee, gentle gentle Pope in J. The serving men and serving maids sat by the kitchen fire, they heard sick a din the parlour within as made them much admire. Out spake the boy in buttons, I ween he wasna thin, now what will tie the parlour gay, and stay this deadly din? And they have ta'en a kerchief, cast it their kevils in, for what will tie the parlour gay, and stay that deadly din? When on that boy the kevil fell to stay the fearsome noise, gay in they cried, Wait her betide, thou prince of button boys. Sign, he has ta'en a supple cane to swinge that dog sae fat, the doggy yowled, the doggy howled the louder eye for that. The doggy ceased his noise sign, he has ta'en a mutton bane, the doggy ceased his noise and followed doon the kitchen stair that prince of button boys. Then sadly spake that lady fair, we a frown upon her brow, O oh dearer to me is my sma doggy than a dozen sick as thou. Nay use, nay use for sighs and tears, nay use at all to fret, sin ye ve bided sa well for thirty years, ye may bide a wee langer yet. Sadly, sadly he crossed the floor and turled at the pin, sadly went he through the door where sadly he came in. O oh, gin I had a Pope in J to fly a in my head, to tell me what I ought to say, I had by this been wed. O oh, gin I find an either lady he said we sighs and tears. I wot my coorten shall not be an either thirty years for gin I find a lady gay, exactly to my taste, I'll pop the question, I or nay, in twenty years at maist. Sadly went he through the door for riddles, these consist of two double acrostics and two charades. No I was written at the request of some young friends who had gone to a ball at an Oxford commemoration, and also as a specimen of what might be done by making the double acrostic a connected poem instead of what it has hitherto been, a string of disjointed stanzas, on every conceivable subject, and about as interesting to read straight through as a page of a cyclopedia. The first two stanzas describe the two main words, and each subsequent stanza one of the cross lights. Number two. Was written after seeing Miss Ellen Terry perform in the play of Hamlet. In this case the first stanza describes the two main words. Number three was written after seeing Miss Marion Terry perform in Mr. Gilbert's play of Pygmalion and Galatea. 
the three stanzas respectively describe my first, my second and my whole. I there was an ancient city, stricken down with a strange frenzy, and for many a day they paced from morn to eve the crowded town, and danced the night away. I asked the cause, the aged man grew sad, they pointed to a building grey and tall, and hoarsely answered step inside, my lad, and then you'll see it all. Yet what are all such gaieties to me whose thoughts are full of indices and certs? x2 plus 7 x plus 53 equals 1 and 1 third but something whispered it will soon be done. Bands cannot always play, nor ladies smile, endure with patience the distasteful fun for just a little while. A change came o'er my vision, it was night, we clove a pathway through a frantic throng, the steeds, wild plunging, filled us with a fright, the chariots whirled along. Within a marble hall a river ran, a living tide, half muslin and half cloth, and here one mourned a broken wreath or fan, yet swallowed down her wrath, and here one offered to a thirsty fair, his words half drowned amid those thunders tuneful, some frozen viand, there were many there a toothache in each spoonful. There comes a happy pause, for human strength will not endure to dance without cessation, and every one must reach the point at length of absolute prostration. At such a moment ladies learn to give, to partners who would urge them overmuch, a flat and yet decided negative, photographers love such. There comes a welcome summons, hope revives, and fading eyes grow bright, and pulses quicken, incessant pop the corks, and busy knives dispense the tongue and chicken. Flushed with new life, the crowd flows back again, and all is tangled talk and mazy motion, much like a waving field of golden grain, or a tempestuous ocean. And thus they give the time, that nature meant for peaceful sleep and meditative snores, to ceaseless din and mindless merriment and waste of shoes and floors. And one, we name him not, that flies the flowers, that dreads the dances, and that shuns the salads, they doom to pass in solitude the hours, writing acrostic ballads. How late it grows. The hour is surely past that should have warned us with its double knock. The twilight wanes, and morning comes at last. Oh, uncle, what's a clock? The uncle gravely nods, and wisely winks. It may mean much, but how is one to know? He opens his mouth. Yet out of it, methinks, no words of wisdom flow. Two empress of art, for thee I twine this wreath with all too slender skill. Forgive my muse each halting line, and for the deed accept the will. O day of tears! Whence comes this spectre grim, parting, like death's cold river, souls that love? Is not he bound to thee, as thou to him, by vows, unwhispered here, yet heard above? And still it lives, that keen and heavenward flame, lives in his eye, and trembles in his tone, and these wild words of fury but proclaim a heart that beats for thee, for thee alone. But all is lost, that mighty mind o'erthrown. Like sweet bells jangled, piteous sight to see. Doubt that the stars are fire so runs his moan, Doubt truth herself, but not my love for thee. A sadder vision yet, 
thine aged sire shaming his hoary locks with treacherous while. And dost thou now doubt truth to be a liar? And wilt thou die, that hast forgot to smile? Nay, get thee hence. Leave all thy winsome ways and the faint fragrance of thy scattered flowers, in holy silence wait the appointed days, and weep away the leaden-footed hours. 3. The air is bright with hues of light and rich with laughter and with singing, young hearts beat high in ecstasy, and banners wave, and bells are ringing, but silence falls with fading day, and there's an end to mirth and play. Ah, well a day rest your old bones, ye wrinkled crones. The kettle sings, the firelight dances. Deep be it quaffed, the magic draught that fills the soul with golden fancies. For youth and pleasance will not stay, and ye are withered, worn, and grey. Ah, well a day. O fair cold face. O form of grace, for human passion madly yearning. O weary air of dumb despair, from marble one to marble turning. Leave us not thus, we fondly pray. We cannot let thee pass away. Ah, well a day. For my first is singular at best, more plural is my second, my third is far the pluralist, so plural plural, I protest it scarcely can be reckoned. My first is followed by a bird my second by believers in magic art, my simple third follows, too often, hopes absurd and plausible deceivers. My first to get at wisdom tries, a failure melancholy. My second men revered as wise, my third from heights of wisdom flies to depths of frantic folly. My first is aging day by day, my second's age is ended, my third enjoys an age, they say, that never seems to fade away, through centuries extended. My whole. I need a poet's pen to paint her myriad phases, the monarch, and the slave, of men, a mountain summit, and a den of dark and deadly mazes, a flashing light, a fleeting shade beginning, end, and middle of all that human art hath made or wit devised. Go, seek her aid, if you would read my riddle. Fame's penny trumpet, affectionately dedicated to all original researchers who pant for endowment. Blow, blow your trumpets till they crack, ye little men of little souls and bid them huddle at your back, gold-sucking leeches, shoals on shoals. Fill all the air with hungry whales, reward us, ere we think or write. Without your gold mere knowledge fails to sate the swinish appetite. And, where great Plato paced serene, or Newton paused with wistful eye, Rush to the chase with hoofs unclean and babel clamour of the sty be yours the pay, be theirs the praise, we will not rob them of their due, nor vex the ghosts of other days by naming them along with you. They sought and found undying fame, they toiled not for reward nor thanks, their cheeks are hot with honest shame for you, the modern mountebanks. Who preach of justice, plead with tears that love and mercy should abound, while marking with complacent ears the moaning of some tortured hound, who prate of wisdom, nay, forbear, lest wisdom turn on you in wrath, trampling, with heel that will not spare, the vermin that beset her path. Go, throng each other's drawing rooms. Ye idols of a petty clique, strut your brief hour in borrowed plumes, and make your penny trumpets squeak. 
go, throng each other's drawing rooms deck your dull talk with pilfered shreds of learning from a nobler time, and oil each other's little heads with mutual flattery's golden slime, and when the topmost height ye gain, and stand in glory's ether clear, and grasp the prize of all your pain, so many hundred pounds a year. Then let fame's banner be unfurled. Sing paeans for a victory won. Ye tapers, that would light the world, and cast a shadow on the sun, who still shall pour his rays sublime, one crystal flood, from east to west, when ye have burned your little time and feebly flickered into rest. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook Phantasmagoria and other poems asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works. So the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start. Full license the full Project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works. By using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg. You agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 by reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 
1.B Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.C below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.E below. 1.C The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.E Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.E.1 The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.E.2 
If an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 Do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark 
but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy. If a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work, you comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9 if you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 1 .f1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement, Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, 
If you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and, c, any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Project Gutenberg trademark symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol's goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help. See sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3
Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501c3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116, 801, 596, 1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements. We know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years. He produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, 
all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.